Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings Magazine at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Wednesday, August 17th, and hopefully my voice will hold out for the full episode today. I'm trying to struggle through a summer cold, not COVID, just uh, some sort of summer crud. Today's episode is brought to you by Raytheon Missiles and Defense. The SPY-6 family of radars is not just revolutionary, it's ready now. SPY-6 is being integrated on ships across the fleet to provide greater range, increased sensitivity, and more accurate discrimination for air and missile defense. To learn more, go to rtx.com forward slash SPY-6. Well, the proceedings team just completed the September Naval Aviation issue today, and we sent it to the printers. A few weeks from now, we'll be in Reno, Nevada for the annual Tailhook Symposium, 8, 9, 10 September. A copy of the September proceedings will go in every attendee's swag bag. Uh, Ward and I and Ward's replacement, a, a young woman named Kelly Welsh, will be at uh, in the Naval Institute booth at Tailhook. So if you're at Tailhook, please stop by and, uh, and see us. And we'll be doing some episodes of the podcast from there as well. A uh, quick reminder that we have deadlines coming up on several of our contests. The Marine Corps Essay Contest has a deadline of 31 August, so two weeks from today. Top prize is $5,000. Our Fiction Essay Contest, co-sponsored with SimSec, has a top prize of $500 and a deadline of mid-September. And our annual photo contest is open now, as is the general prize essay contest, which has a top prize of $6,000 uh, and a deadline of 31 October. To find out more, go to our essay contest page uh, on our website. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Captain M.K. Hayes and Commander Joel Holwit, U.S. Navy. They are the co-authors of a powerful article on shipboard firefighting in the August issue of Proceedings. It is titled, Every Sailor a, a Firefighter. Captain Hayes, Commander Holwit, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. Great to be here. All right. Just a, a brief introduction here. I want to start out. This is my first time in recent memory that a surface warfare officer and a submarine submariner have teamed up to write an article. So that was kind of cool. Our, our staff and our ed board loved that about this. Uh, Captain Hayes, you commanded a destroyer, the USS Decatur, DDG-73. And then you had command of a float training group Atlantic. And now you're in training for a major command. Do you know yet what your next command will be? Uh, sir, I, uh, I commanded a float training group in Norfolk. And uh, right now I'm slated to go to DDG-128. That's a uh, Flight 3 Destroyer, the PCU Ted Stevens, under construction in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Fantastic. All right. Good for you. Congratulations. And Joel Holwit, uh, a lot of our listeners and viewers are familiar with uh, with your name. Uh, Joel has won a number of our essay contests, including the CNO Naval History Contest, several times. He published his first piece in Proceedings when he was an ensign in 2003. He is currently the commanding officer of the USS Toledo SSN 769. So Joel, you're joining us from uh, from Portsmouth and your ship is in the shipyards. How's that going? Uh, we are, uh, we're making progress one day at a time. Shipyard command is hard. That is just hard, hard duty. Yeah. Uh, well, great to have you both on the show. I want to throw the first question to Captain Hayes uh, and hopefully we'll be getting some comments in from our, our, our listeners today. So we'll go to a few of those um, um, comments, but hey, Bill, uh, before, before you go too far, to keep faith with our PAO and our JAG, I do have to say that the views presented here are those of of us, uh, Captain Hayes and myself, and they do not rep necessarily represent the views of the DOD or its components. So, thank you for doing that. Okay. All right, I want to keep faith with them. Perfect, perfect. All right, now first question to Captain Hayes. Your article starts off with this statement: "Quote as the loss of the USS Bonham Richard." LHD-6 and USS Miami SSN 755 illustrate in-port fires are more challenging than at-sea fires. Explain that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, both Joel and I will agree, and most people who've been in the yards will agree, you don't have the, the people and the equipment that you normally have underway. So that core group of experts on firefighting plus the entire crew as well as all the equipment that you normally have for firefighting, firefighting systems, uh, firefighting um, lockers, all the spaces are open. Uh, in port, you don't have that, or in, excuse me, in the yards, you don't have that. You have a lot of um, people that aren't ship's company on the ship. You have a lot of things that are in layup. 
um, your air systems, your firefighting systems, some of your areas may be inaccessible. So it, it makes a really tough problem, especially at night after the bulk of the crew goes home for the day. Good points. Um, so Joel, the Bonham Richard fire was just two years ago and it's still very fresh in, in our minds, but a lot of our listeners might not be familiar with the USS, Fi the USS Miami fire. Tell us about that one. Um, okay, uh, Bill, that was uh, May of uh, 2012. USS Miami was in a engineered overhaul, uh, very similar to what my ship is going through. They had uh, dry docked only about three months earlier, and they, uh, the ship had uh, secured all of its normal systems. They had a significant number of temporary systems running through the ship. Uh, and then they, uh, a uh, shipyard worker um, during dinner uh, lit a fire in uh, one of the officer staterooms. Uh, and then um, the, uh, that fire was called away in the wrong spot uh, by a different shipyard worker. Um, and the ship uh, started responding, but it was already, you know, most of the crew had already gone home. Uh, so you only had the duty section available. Uh, the person who should have been the first responder uh, was topside and never went below. Uh, we had two other sailors who very bravely uh, rushed into the compartment trying to figure out where the fire was. Um, it, it was already about 10 to 15 minutes after that fire had started when they went in there. Uh, they tried doing it without breathing protection. They were on breath holes. They never really got to the seat of the fire. In fact, for a very long period, they kept thinking the fire was in the wrong place based off the wrong initial report. Um, and uh, ultimately, the fire consumed the forward compartment. We never uh, were able to effectively put agent on it, and we just had to essentially wait for the fire to burn itself out um after putting a significant amount of cooling water on the uh, on the ship and as a result the ship was completely lost it was we had to scrap her very shortly afterwards and it was a real shame because she was only about halfway to about two-thirds through her service life unbelievable yeah um reminds me so much of the the story of the bonham richard and, and watching that ship burn in san diego two years ago um so the article points out, this is, uh, I'll go back to Captain Hayes. Uh, since 2008, your article points out that Navy has had 15 major fires. Two were at sea and 13 were in port. Uh, so just a little bit more, if you could, I want to tease out a little bit more about um, why the fire hazard is, is so much higher in port and why it's so much harder to put out uh, fires in port. Uh, because, I mean, I mean, you know, I remember mostly being underway for me. I was a member of the air wing as an intel officer. I was usually with a squadron or the air wing or the carrier strike group. And so I didn't spend a lot of time on, on ships in the yards in my career. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of fire drills at sea, uh, a lot of, you know, um, GQ and that sort of thing. A lot of, uh, you know, times on carriers where you got uh, a float training group trainers coming out and doing training on the ship at sea, but I didn't get to see what it was like in the yard. So tell, tell our listeners a little bit more about that. Um, absolutely, Bill. And please, Joel, like jump in. Your ship is in the yards right now, but um, the yards is, uh, it's a really tough period for the ship. I mean, the ship is torn apart. It gets new equipment, new systems, uh, repairs to things like, uh, you know, the, the hull structure, the, um, piping systems. And so the status of equipment, the status of gear is very dynamic. The status of which spaces are accessible by the crew, like a passageway you could walk through, change on a daily basis. The um, work that's being done on the ship is also very dynamic and often involves hot work. So welding, grinding, things that have a spark. Um, and there's, of course, a process by which the uh, you know, anyone doing any type of hot work, whether your ship's force or uh, the shipyard workers goes and gets permission to conduct that hot work. But sometimes things aren't quite uh, ready. And sometimes things are, uh, you know, go bad. And especially in the shipyard, uh, especially after hours or on the weekend, maybe second shift, you don't have the bulk of the crew there to, uh, to notice when a fire might be growing or spreading. Um, you may have the bulk of the crew at dinner, say on the birthing barge, where ju there's just a few people uh, on the ship at night. And um, it makes it very difficult to monitor every space on the ship. You have systems that are tagged out, whether that's a fire alarm, a smoke alarm, a flooding alarm, or a fire pump. 
um, the shipyard is required to provide you with firefighting equipment, such as fire hoses and uh, um, you know phones with which to call a fire department. But it's just not the same. You don't have the same amount. You don't have the same familiarity with the equipment. And oftentimes, that dynamic environment, it's hard to keep up from uh, what changes are in place and uh, how um, how the work is progressing from day to day. Did, did that answer your question? Oh, absolutely. No, that that is really good. And and for Joel, because your ship is in the yards right now, in a, in a similar situation, the, the same sort of industrial process that the Miami was going through. Uh, just give us a, you know your perspective. Of what's what are some of those day to day challenges of of getting the you know getting a submarine through a yard a long yard period? You said it was. Uh, Going to be 18 months and now it's 25 months or, or, or plus right uh yeah we're, we're looking at uh many more months uh probably a little past the halfway point i hope um i mean in terms of some of the challenges that we deal with and and what you know going to what captain hayes was saying i mean for firefighting in particular first off there's a lot more threat vectors in the yard uh hot work is happening at all times of the day uh that's grinding that's welding um all sorts of things that, like she said, it creates a spark. Um, the ship is not as clean as it is when we are at sea. Um, and although we do our best to maintain a very high standard, particularly for uh, for the submarine force, um, there is uh, there is no comparison between being in the yard in an industrial environment and being at sea. It's just always going to be dealing with uh, work sites uh, that are kept to a different standard, and you have to stay on top of your shipyard partners all the time uh, to make that work out. Um, and then in terms of actually just transiting through the ship, there are just temporary services everywhere. Ventilation is down. Uh, the potable system is down. There's no sanitaries. There are no um, normal lighting is gone. You are reduced to using uh, strings of light that the shipyard puts up. Um, and uh, your intercom system is taken down. So you're using a temporary intercom system uh, that has its own uh, dynamics and uh, issues. Um, and then just getting through that. All right. Um, you know, I think I'm a relatively small person. Uh, I spend a lot of time bending over double wearing a hard hat, uh, and boots going through spaces and, um, you know, to show at one point, my, my ship safety officer, the challenges of how some of the staging and scaffolding that have been put in my ship, how challenging it was. I actually had one of my sailors dress out in a firefighting ensemble wearing a, uh, Scott air pack. Uh, the, uh, the the self-contained breeding apparatus, the same one that firefighters wear. So he's wearing the same kind of firefighting outfit that firefighters would wear going through my ship and that my crew would wear going to fight a fire. Um, and at one point going down a ladder, he actually dislocated his knee. It was one of the worst moments of my command tour knowing that I put my sailor in that position. Uh, but it was a really eloquent also uh, illustration to everybody about how challenging they we had made transiting the ship and how dangerous it would be just – I mean, we, we had no emergency going on. He was just transiting ship as an illustration of how challenging things had become. And uh, I had to medevac him off the boat. Uh, we had to put him actually on a, on a, you know, in a stretcher on a crane, you know, that a crane lifted out of the dry dock to get him to the ambulance. Um, that was very, uh, it, was, it was an awful moment uh, to experience, but it really showed how difficult it has become. And all of those systems that are now, you know, you have these giant ventilation tubes that are hanging, uh, all these power cables, all these light strands, they all have to be hung with the right kind of uh, cordage. On Miami, they were hung with flammable uh, rope uh, that when it burned through, all that stuff fell and it blocked firefighters from getting to where they needed to get it. At some points, firefighters getting blocked from the egresses that they needed to go through and you know, having to fight their way through all these services that had collapsed in front of them. Amazing. So uh, your article talks a bit about ownership and responsibility. And I think this is one of the things that's very confusing uh, to folks who are not well versed in this, particularly if you haven't spent a lot of time uh, in the yards or been a shipyard worker. And when the Navy delivers a ship back to the shipyards for um, for an overhaul, um, you know, where, where's the responsibility? So, you know, where does the Navy draw the line for ships in port between the crew's responsibility to fight a fire and the shipyard's responsibility and, and or the civilian fire department? on the base to, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start um okay. and, and and captain hayes i hope will jump in uh uh i mean first off the responsibility for the ship remains ours all right i remain responsible for my ship uh you know, 
any other CEO remains responsible. The crews remain responsible. The only people who will absolutely be there when a fire starts and should put out the fire in the initial minutes is the crew. Um, they can't wait for the fire department. I think this is one of the many things that went wrong on Bone Home Richard and Miami was uh, I think there's a perspective that many people have that the ship pulls in, the fire department is close by, help is nearby, and they think to themselves, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't need to be good at this. I can let uh, I can let these other professional firefighters do it, and I think that that's just the wrong attitude because uh, the initial minutes to contain the fire, to put out the fire, the only people present will be the crew. We have to own it. Uh, we have to own everything that leads up to it too, whether that's the cleanliness and preservation standards to make sure that we are not allowing shoddy work sites that will uh, catch on fire and allow a fire to spread. Um, to the to the how we rapidly respond. Um, having people always present in every compartment, uh, at least on a submarine, uh, to be able to quickly identify that there is a fire and rapidly call it away and rapidly start responding to it. Um, those are all things the crew has to own. And if you think that you can wait for the fire department to show up, uh, you're probably going to lose the ship or you're going to lose a portion of the ship like we did with Miami. Um, because uh, by the time the fastest fire department shows up, and maybe that's going to be 10 minutes, maybe it's going to be 20 minutes, a uh, flashover will occur. And at that point, you're going from fighting, which, which, which should have been a contained small fire, to a major fire that's going to be multiple decks, multiple locations, um, and it's going to require a significant amount of water to put out. And as one of the uh, Fed Fire Chiefs, when, when I do my quarterly drills, uh, put it, you know, we were, you know, talking about things we could do, with, you know, fighting a multi-level fire that we were doing in the drill. And he said, sir, you have to defeat the number of BTUs. Uh, right now, we got to figure out how to defeat the BTUs this fire is putting out, and I need to put more. You need to put more water on it, and that's going to be challenging. It's challenging this submarine to put more than one hose on a fire uh, in in more than one location. Uh, that's a great point about the speed to the speed to answer the problem. How about Captain Hayes? Any any thoughts from your side? I absolutely agree with Joel. I, I mean, it's always the crew's responsibility to take care of the ship, no matter if the ship is deployed or in the shipyard. Um, it's also the crew's responsibility uh, to essentially call the fire department. And I'm not saying wait for the fire department at all. The crew's responsibility is to uh, attempt to put that fire out to the best of their ability. But um, in the shipyard, they do need to call for help. They do need to call the other ships around them. They need to call the fire department. Um, they give the crew a phone and instructions on how to do that. And um, I think one of the things is that uh, in particular, many of the roving watches are, are junior sailors. And those junior sailors need to be confident in thinking, hey, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't look right. I think the smoke might be from a fire. I think that this fire could spread. I think I should report this. And having a young sailor that maybe is uh, on their third or fourth watch, semi, you know, semi new to the crew, um, it's on the ship's leadership to in ensure those individuals have the confidence and the competence to report potentially a huge casualty over to the quarter deck, over to that chain of command, so that the response is quick and decisive. So that leads to my next question really, really very nicely, which is uh, in your article, you write in port and shipyard ships must be able to fight fires with only the duty section. To ensure they can do this effectively, every sailor must be a firefighter. So um, if you would both describe a little bit what kind of firefighting training that your average sailor gets before they arrive on a submarine or on a ship, is it sufficient? And if not, you know, what needs to be done about that? Joel, let's start with you. Okay, well, um, so uh, most of my sailors, uh, before they arrive, they do go through a basic firefighting trainer, whether that's in the nuclear training pipeline or in the, uh, uh, the basic uh, submarine school uh, for forward rates. Uh, non-nuclear rates going through submarine school. They'll, they'll, they'll normally get some sort of basic firefighting training. During the era of COVID, I know some of my sailors told me we didn't get that. Uh, so that certainly was a handicap. Um, and then when they get to the ship, uh, we do a lot of on-the-job training. Every submariner likes to think, we, you know, we do not have damage controlmen on board submarines. We like to think that every submariner is a damage controlman. Um, I would also say now that I've been doing this for a year and a half and uh, really putting my crew through their paces, I would tell you that uh, while we pride ourselves on making everybody show uh, the ability to do that during the qualification process, uh, we very quickly um, uh, get away from that. Uh, at sea, I normally have a, uh, I have people who I've called out on the watch quarter station bill, and these are the guys who go to fight the fire uh, when we call away a fire. And there's 
it's a pretty select group of people. I'm not talking, you know, no more than 20 or 30 uh, sailors, uh, officers and chiefs. Um, and, uh, and the rest of the crew, I mean, like they might, the only time they might put on a firefighting ensemble or a, uh, a self-contained breathing apparatus might be during their qualifications. Uh, they might never do it again. Um, and so, uh, you really have to start, uh, putting in the reps for that, uh, with on the job training, but, uh, in terms of what they come with, uh, it can be very, very basic. And then we're supposed to send them to a basic and advanced firefighting schools. Uh, but even then that's only a, um, I, I would say that's only a, 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 a fraction of the crew who actually goes to that. It can be up to half, but, um, that's only a couple of days and it's, uh, at the you know ultimately you know you need to have you need to be frequently doing this to build a muscle memory to be really good at uh, naval firefighting great points uh, captain hayes uh things are fairly similar in the service community every uh sailor on board a ship is required to go to basic firefighting school um and then some cadre of of uh, sailors is required to go to the advanced school i've been to both of those schools numerous times you have to go back every every tour so every commanding officer has been to the basic school right before they come back so there uh there's some goodness there uh it's a real fire in a dark room you're there working with your team and breathing air and it's hot and it's smoky and so you get that feeling of stress of teamwork of wondering uh is this fire ever going to go out um but but you're only really required to go to that once every five years. So, um, you know, when you get to the ship, that firefighting schoolhouse is fairly generic. They show you how to use a self-contained breathing apparatus. They show you uh, essentially how to handle a fire hose. But when you get to the ship, that's when you're required to qualify in basic damage control, advanced damage control, what have you. And that's a lot of specific, this is where our repair lockers are. This is where your watch station is. This is how, um, this is where the space is. This is how to access a space. So all the specific training of how the ship's firefighting systems work, such as, uh, you know, the, the fixed systems, the installed systems on the ship, all of that is done by, by the ship. There's a Navy wide PQS, of course, but it's dependent upon the ship to, uh, train sailors and it's dependent upon the ship to run drills, uh, to keep the ship safe. Gotcha. Um, we have a question, a couple of questions and comments from Austere Roberta, one of our, our viewers. Um, uh, and a couple of minutes ago, Joel, you mentioned fed fire and some fire drills. So the question is, do you think the big 8010 fire drills are over choreographed? And how do we stop that? They can be. Uh, and I think the way to stop that is by the command demanding to run uh, good drills. So my very first chapter 12, 8010, uh, 8010 manual, chapter 12 drill, um, when I got to the shipyard, my crew and I treated that just like an at-sea fire. My XO, we, we had the entire crew present. My XO showed up to be the uh, scene leader inside the compartment. Um, and uh, we very much, you know, just treated it like it was an at-sea fire. Um, and then after that, we started demanding, no, we want to do this with only the duty section. We want to do this on the back shift. We want to uh, do these um, kind of strange scenarios. And I was very lucky that my uh, uh, submarine safety uh, manager at the uh, Norfolk Naval Shipyard has been uh, absolutely supportive about doing that and uh, wants uh, to push those hard scenarios. And so my chapter 13 drill, which is the uh, apocalyptic two plus hour a uh, drill where we bring in firefighters from off the yard, where we will partner with the other ships and we will uh, integrate all of our teams. Um, you know, we did that at night. We started it at, uh, I think, uh, 8 p.m. And uh, my entire crew had to drive in uh, for the drill. Uh, it started in the at, at night and uh, we brought in firefighters at night. And it was very much what I think the uh, Miami scenario was like, where it started right at dinner and uh, it went through the whole night. Um, so I think, I think that's, you know, like it requires command involvement. It also requires having the right shipyard partners who are willing to, uh, to do that. But uh, the command has to absolutely set a high standard and, uh, and do that. And then you have to train your crew to be able to succeed that way. You don't, you, you don't want to fail. Yeah. Good for you. No, that sounds like very uh, realistic training, especially to do it after hours and to pull people back in. Uh, after they've gone home, that, that's that's a you know that's a scenario that's not going to 
make you a lot of points <laughs> in terms of uh, you know morale, but it, it will certainly make you a lot of points when it comes to you know building a real firefighting team. Good for you for doing that. Um, I wanted to ask you both, as you've watched, uh, Joel, you've been in command uh, of a submarine and you probably took command of the submarine just as the, as the Bonham Richard fire happened. Uh, and MK, you know, you were at a float training group Atlantic or uh, sorry, Norfolk. Um, and, and so I'm sure that your command had to take on board a lot of the lessons from that, uh, that disaster. So for, for the both of you, what are some key takeaways from that, from that fire and from, um, you know, what the investigations has revealed? So um, I think, you know, we all watched the, you know, fire. I mean, it was like daily news reports. I mean, we all watched it on TV and we watched, we read everything we could about it. And you're, you know, you just kind of feel, uh, feel for the crew. And, and so there, there was this immediate, we didn't, we didn't wait. We, there was an immediate, what can we do? And the big uh, thing we realized was that a float training group, uh, we did not conduct um, any shipboard assessments during an industrial availability. So we would give training uh, in the basic phase about uh, you know any number of things, flood, fire, flooding, toxic gas, GQ, um, material condition of your firefighting equipment, all of that was happening. But once the ship was complete with that, that was it, we weren't coming back. And we realized that there was uh, a gap in training. So we started to go out to the ships in the shipyard and uh, we realized a lot of crew members were new, had not deployed with a ship didn't necessarily have um, a lot of exposure to a float training or a float training group. And so we uh, started training ships and assessing ships um, before their chapter 12 drill. And I'd like to think that we, um, you know, help the ships prepare for that drill, make it less choreographed, going back to the, less, the last question. Um, things like, how do you actually um, disconnect these services to close a door? How do you, um, recharge your SCBA, your self-contained breathing apparatus after a drill. So all of those things we saw as, um, you know, we started going out to the waterfront and asking asking ships questions and what they wanted and we developed a training program. And that was, that happened before the official report came out. Um, and and I think it was just a response to how do we help? Uh, you know, that's, that's a, you know, people were pouring into Naval Station San Diego to help, right? Well, here we are in Norfolk, how do we help? We help by training the waterfront to recognize the danger and, and uh, combat against any type of fire. Good for you. Now that, that sounds like a, a major change for, from uh, yeah, the, the focus of ATG. I remember when, when I was on sea duties, I'd never heard of ATG being focused on, you know, um, damage control in the shipyards or in, you know, in port, but that's uh, an immediate lesson and also an immediate action that you could take. Good for you to, for doing that. Um, what, what are some equipment or material changes that the Navy needs to make to help improve uh, shipboard firefighting, particularly in port and during uh, yards periods? Um, I've got some thoughts. Uh, first off, I think uh, you know, uh, Captain Hayes brought up the uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, being able to recharge that. Um, you know, some reasons we take down our high, high pressure air system very early during availability. I have to have a pure side ability to recharge my uh my self-contained breathing apparatuses um and uh since i do frequent drills i need to be able to do that myself and not have to wait uh for the fire department to take my my used scba's recharge them and bring it back to me which was what i was having to do at the beginning of my availability um and i found that very frustrating because it meant that there would be times where i had vulnerabilities where i didn't have every single one of my self-contained breathing apparatuses available and fully charged um, what we also uh, need are better uh, thermal imagers. The Naval Firefighting Thermal Imager is, uh, it's old. It's an, I think it's the best of 80s, 90s technology. Mm. And uh, it was really cool. Back then, I would tell you, it is very antiquated now. Uh, when we ordered more thermal imagers, because I discovered you need to have more than the normal amount that you have for underway firefighting. Uh, so we ordered more, uh, more than double, in fact, of what we normally have. I actually managed to get the new thermal imager cameras and, uh, I'm a fan, love them. Uh, very intuitive to use, much better battery life, uh, and uh, much better uh, uh, just ability for a new sailor to be able to turn it on and use it and understand what he is seeing. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of these thermal imager cameras. 
I'm told that there are new uh, firefighting ensembles where a thermal imager is actually built into the uh, into the uh, visor or whatever of the helmet. Um, I, I would love to play with those and see uh, what those bring to us. I, I think some people call them the predator suits, and uh, I, I can say my crew would be absolutely on board with trying to use that. Um, uh, DC Connex boxes. We have these damage control uh, container express boxes. Normally, each submarine's issued one. I, I, I don't know what the surface fleet has issued. I think I need more uh, than one just to have enough SCBAs, self-contained breathing apparatuses, enough firefighting ensembles so that if it is an extended firefight, I will be able to uh, dress out most of my crew for a one to two hour period before I really need to start figuring out where am I going to get uh, more suits? Uh, where am I going to get things? Because, uh, you know, once, a, once someone has worn a firefighting ensemble and maybe at least twice, that thing is going to be soaked with sweat and it's not going to be uh, comfortable to wear. And certainly it's going to be very, very heavy for whoever is marching into the fire uh, to wear it. Um, and, uh, and last but not least, uh, communications are key. Uh, like I told you, the, uh, the, the, we take down our normal intercom system. It gets replaced by a uh, special casualty control inter intercom system, uh, it, it, that, which is robust, but it's also uh, it, it has its challenges. It's something that I think definitely could be improved upon. Uh, it has a few areas where I think it has single point vulnerabilities that do need to be addressed and that uh, – I've, I've been working through my chain of command to see if we can uh, work on and address those. Um, but in, additionally, we need to have more radios. Uh, my submarine did not come into the yard with any uh, firefighting radios. We get issued those at the DC Connex box. I think that's just something we should just normally have. Other classes of submarine, Virginia's, Ohio's, they normally have these radios. Uh, and I think that they're very, uh, just something that is just should be normal. Uh, instead of something that you only use for firefighting, they can also these things can also use up batteries if you don't treat them the right way. But I'm a huge fan of the radios. We we start to use them all the time, and I think they're very helpful. Uh, but it's just not something that we do all the time. We just don't have enough of these radios, in my opinion, to really have uh, reliability and robustness. Um, so those those are some things that I think we could do um, and uh, really uh, make it um, make the firefighting uh, battle easier to win. Thanks, uh, Captain Hayes, your, your perspective on that? No, I agree with Joel, especially on the SCBA front. Um, you know, in an actual fire, people are going to be stressed, they're going to be hot, they're going to be in a smoky environment, and they're going to suck down that 45-minute bottle of air in 15 minutes or less. And next thing you know, um, you can't keep up with the recharge capacity, uh, and you're going to need uh, some way to do that better in the yards. The surface ships in particular at the private yards don't often have um, accessible recharge capability. So uh, I know the Navy's working on that with some portable trucks and uh, things of that nature, but I think that's probably one of the biggest things. Uh, you know, the fire department will often come and recharge them during a drill, but um, in order for ships to really get after the training and understand what it is, we should say, hey, 15 minutes, your SCBA is up, even if it's really not in a drill. And, and sort of test that capacity and what those ships are gonna do. That's probably the main thing I see is just kind of running out of ability to fight a fire because you don't have, uh, you don't have enough breathing air. So uh, from the lessons from the Bonham Richard fire, the firefighting teams, when they were on the fire, how, how long were they lasting? Were they there for 10, 15 minutes or was it shorter than that? I mean, how, how long could they, you know, even stay that close to the, the flames, which I understand in some of the spaces were, you know, 1200 degrees and even higher than that. So my understanding is really each, each host team went in, you go in, you, you ostensibly have 45 minutes of air in a bottle and um, that was getting used up in 15 minutes or less. Um, the, but those sailors weren't even at the seat of the fire. Uh, you know, they would go in, the fire burned so hot, there was so much combustible material in that space that they weren't even able to really attack the seat of the fire. Um, you know, they were able to, you know, try to contain and put some parts out of it or parts out, but, you know, not enough, of course, we ended up losing the ship, but the immediate temperature in the spaces and the um, kind of misunderstanding of what was causing the fire and where the seat of the fire was meant that nobody really was able to attack the seat of the fire until it got too hot. Uh, I would add to that, like with Miami, uh, there were multiple teams that would get to the scene, start fighting, and immediately have to leave because they ran out of air. 
Um, and uh, during my chapter 12 drills and my weekly drills, uh, I hold my sailors to only one five minutes. Uh, my casualty coordinator has to send a new team of sailors into the ship every one five minutes, no matter what. And what we have seen is, uh, you know, uh, even in a just a drill, uh, you know, I've I've big guys and they will suck down that air. Uh, and a lot of them will be running out of air at the one five minute about at the 15 minute point. And uh, that's, um, you know, that's absolutely I think it's only going to be worse with the pressure and the heat of a real fire. Great points. Um, we're running out of time. So just, you know, any any last minute uh, thoughts from either of you closing closing comments before we uh, before we close out the show? Uh, I'll, go, I'll go first. Okay, Joe. Uh, you know, and, and let put Captain Hayes go last. I um, I think uh, I think the most important thing I have really taken away uh, is that this requires a lot of reps. You uh, it's if if you want to build that muscle memory, you've got to got to be willing to build the reps, and you've got to do a lot of drills. Um, I thought I was getting really good. Uh, I thought my crew was getting really good at firefighting last year at this time. Uh, we had done all these drills. We had done very well in them. And then I shifted to a new location and we started not doing well. And then I started ramping up the number of drills we were doing. I got to the point where I was doing a daily drill because I was so uh, so dismayed by our performance and wondering what the heck was going on. Um, and that's when I realized that uh, despite, you know, my best efforts, you know, like, the, you know, some of my guys have just been like, oh, there's going to be a drill. I will, I will make sure I show up for this um, instead of the, you know, hey, everybody – is going to participate, you know, and it doesn't matter when that happens and you, you get what you get and you, you just have to deal with the duty section you have. Um, and so I ultimately went to doing drills every Tuesday and Thursday morning, uh, which was exhausting. Um, but it was what we needed to do to get the crew to this level of proficiency where any sailor at any time could feel they could feel that they might discover fire and they could start fighting it. They would call it away properly and that they knew that their shipmates would put on a self-contained breathing apparatus and relieve them within three minutes uh, to save their lives um, while everyone else was dressing out in firefighting ensembles. And then we were getting four teams of guys in firefighting ensembles into the ship to fight the fire. I, so to me, that's my big takeaway is you have to be willing to put in the reps and do the drills and to treat shipyard import firefighting as the more challenging scenario that it really is. Before we go to Captain Hayes, I just want to read one of the comments from one of our, uh, our viewers what is going on with shipping? That's the uh, viewer's name. He writes, the best SCBA drill, suit the crews up and play dodgeball. It teaches the crews how to breathe in packs and it teaches them their limits. Fantastic comment. I love it. Uh, over to you, Captain Hayes, for a uh, final comment. I, I like the dodgeball idea. And I think, um, you know, there are a lot of ideas out there in the fleet and there's working groups. There's all kinds of things that people in the Navy are trying to do to make things better. And so the takeaway isn't that, uh, you know, hey, you know, this would have never happened in my ship. That, that's wrong. There's all kinds of good ideas out there how to make things better, the right equipment, the right training. Uh, I like the dodgeball idea. Uh, you know, it sounds both fun and good training. And I think that kind of goes back to, in general, um, nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to look like an idiot or stupid in front of their superiors. And so sometimes it's easy to get into this mentality where the people that are always the ones that want to wear the SCBA to suit up, to go be in the front row at the, row at the dodgeball game are people who feel comfortable with, with the equipment. Those people that are um, maybe lingering in the back or they don't want to raise their hand to try on the SCBA or they've never been oh, a plug man or a nozzle man on the host team. Those are the people that you really um, are going to end up relying on in a real casualty. So those people need the exact same training to build their confidence. And, and it's not that they're bad, bad sailors or bad people. They just don't want to look dumb in front of their friends and their superiors. And I think that's a very human thing. And to get at that psychology, we all need to put ourselves out there and, and, uh, and train, train, train as much as we can. Um, do tough drills. It's okay to fail a fire drill. I mean, uh, failure oftentimes precipitates in kind of a, what are our lessons learned here? What can we improve? Um, what are things that maybe would make this more interesting or better training? And, and so if, um, you know, you're on a ship and you fail a drill, that could turn into something great. So I think my kind of takeaway is um, it's, it's okay to force someone to do something that they're not necessarily comfortable with. It's okay to fail a training scenario. It helps us get better in the long run. 
Great points. Well, thank you both for, for writing this article, Every Sailor a Firefighter, and for being on the show today. Your comments were just really, um, I, th I, I think, just got to a, a, a key part of being in the Navy, this, this aspect of damage control and firefighting, the ability to save your ship from what is a, a huge threat. Uh, and as you point out, you know, we've, the Navy's lost two ships, uh, completely lost two ships, the Miami and the Bonhomme Richard in the last decade to fires. So this is a, a real problem and something that deserves a lot of attention. So thank you. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast. Our producers, Heather Legg and Raytheon, is our sponsor this month. Raytheon Missiles and Defense is setting the pace of performance with the SPY-6 family of radars actively being integrated across the fleet. SPY-6 provides the clearest possible picture of the battle space with modular multi-mission capabilities that make it the most advanced radar on Earth. Learn more at rtx.com forward slash SPY-6. Our next episode... Uh, Jim Fennell, retired Navy captain and former director of intelligence of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, will talk to us about the PLA Navy, the Chinese PLA Navy. Until then, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. We'll catch you again soon.